You know, we have a rich heritage of music in the church, not only historically, but contemporaneously. The Lord keeps reminding people of his great work, and people keep writing great anthems of praise to the crucified and risen Savior. I, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. So we're thinking today about this theme, our resurrected Savior led captivity captive. We're going to look at that phrase. It's one of the most intriguing in all of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. I hope you have a Bible with you. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the verses on the screen for you, but we, don't, we want you to have your own Bible. We seriously do. Stand with me, if you would, and just follow along as I read uh, these verses. We've preached through Ephesians here several years ago. What a wonderful book. What a wonderful letter written to a church that Paul loved so dearly. He's just described in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 4 the unity that we have in Christ. And what he does at verse 7 and following, he shifts to the diversity that while, while we have unity in Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we are, we are diverse. We are, we are unique individuals, saved and gifted. So just follow along as I read these verses. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May it speak to us today along several lines. To those who are not yet set free, who are yet in the bondage of sin, that Jesus Christ, the resurrected King, would begin the work today of resurrecting you. To those of us who have been set free, that we would understand that we were set free from a, from a wicked master and brought into the house of a tender master. And for those believers who may be struggling with something, some addiction, some, some besetting sin that's got you, got a hold of you, may you experience again the power of captivity being led captive. Thank you. Be seated, please. This term, the, the English Standard Version says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. And I think I know what the writers were trying to get at. But what Paul does here in the Greek is he uses the same word as a noun and then as a verb. It's the same word in a verbal form and then speaking of it as a noun. And he's, what he's doing is he's restating Psalm 68, 18. It says, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord may dwell there. The image in the psalm was of, of a, an army general in Old Testament days, and Paul, Paul no doubt has in his mind the actions of a general in New Testament times. The Roman generals would would go off to war and conquer their enemies. And when they returned with success in battle, a great parade was organized for them on their return. And trailing in the triumphal procession would be a number of captives taken by the general in his engagements with the enemy. He would lead captivity captive. In other words, he would capture those foes and make them his captives. He would then sit on an elevated chair and give out the plunder that was seized in war. It would go to those who had fought with him and for him. And different gifts would go to different people. Paul takes this picture and uses it to speak of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension 
of Jesus Christ. And I want us just for a few minutes today to think along three, three lines here. First, our resurrected Savior led captivity captive. And then to understand that our resurrected Savior first descended into death. And then our resurrected Savior is victorious over all our enemies. Let's look at this for a few minutes today. First of all, our resurrected Savior led captivity captive. He says, by the grace, by, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led, and I'm just going to and give it to you the way it is, in the, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. When Jesus was teaching, recorded in John 3, verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This is an interesting picture here. Because what Paul's going to do is going to get ahead of himself. He's going to say that when he ascended on high, he's talking about the last thing Jesus did on this earth. His ascension. We know it was seen by 500 brethren. Paul records that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, he showed himself to the twelve, he, to 500 brethren, many of whom are alive at the very time I write this letter to the Corinthian church. And then to me, he said, is one born out of due season. The ascension of Jesus Christ, the last look that his followers got of him before they either meet him in heaven or he returns to call us all home. So the ascension is what Paul puts out. But notice what happens when you, when you speak about ascension. That it implies a descending. It, apply, it implies a death. It implies a resurrection. And Paul touches on this here. But I want you to think for just a few minutes today. You see, John 8, 34, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees there. And he, they're telling him, we're, we're children of Abraham. And he says, no, if Abraham were your father, you would, you would believe me. You would embrace me. But you, you do act like your father. You're of your father, the devil. They were highly offended by that. He said, truly, truly, verse 34 of chapter 8, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You see, dear ones, we came into this world as fallen sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. There's no neutrality. We are born, the Bible teaches, dead in trespasses and sin. And to be dead in trespasses and sin is to be a slave to sin. Even before, before a baby can make movements that would be considered disobedience, there is a sin nature. We were born captives. Because of our first parents, Adam and Eve, who were, who were created. They weren't born. They were created upright, placed in the garden. They chose to sin against God, and their sin plunged all of humanity into a sin nature. Paul says in Corinthians, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So the first thing we've got to recognize is that we are born captives. We are born Slaves of the God of this world, Satan, Lucifer, the devil. We do his bidding. And then Jesus comes. He comes and he lives the perfect life that you and I are commanded by the law of God to live. The, the Old Testament and Deuteronomy said, do this and live. In fact, the Puritans came up with a little couplet. Do this and live, the law demands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. A sweeter sound the gospel brings, it bids us fly and gives us wings. You see, the law of God to the unconverted person 
is a plumb line to remind us just how crooked we are, how, how sinful we are. It stirs that up in us. And Jesus comes. He perfectly keeps the law of God. I've never done that. I don't do it now. Jesus did. Perfectly kept the whole law of God. And in the fullness of time, offered himself up. Pilate said to him there in, the, in, that, in that scene in the praetorium when he said, don't you realize I have, I have your life in my hands? I have power. And Jesus looked at him and said, any power you have has been given you from above. He had said in another place, no man takes my life. I lay it down. I take it up. In the fullness of time, Jesus offered himself to be the ransom, to be the sacrifice, to be the redeemer. Those, those terms, one of the words for redeemer in the New Testament is to, is to, is to purchase. Then there's an intensified form of that. And it means to purchase out of, to buy out of. And the picture there is of the slave markets of the day. When, when someone would redeem a slave, not, not buying the slave to hurt and punish him or her, but to purchase the redemption for that slave, to bring them out of the slavery. That's what Jesus did for us. He, he redeemed us. But Paul says he led captivity captive. I'm afraid a lot of professing Christians today understand and at some level and appreciate that they were, they were redeemed, they were bought with a price and set free. But you see, the freedom that we're set free unto is a freedom to be a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus, one of the leading Pharisees of his day, who changed his name to Paul after his conversion, who was a free man. He was a Jew, but he had Roman citizenship. He was free. And yet he, he did not shy away from, in fact, embraced the idea that he was a bond slave of Christ. Paul understood that Christ purchased him for the glory of God and the advance of the gospel. You see, when Jesus ascended, after he had died on the cross, that cruel, horrible death, after he came out of the tomb, I, I love S.M. Lockridge, who was referenced there. I, I got to hear him preach a couple of times. He stood up in a, at the uh, Gwynn Auditorium on the campus of Louisiana College. And he was preaching at the Louisiana Baptist Convention. He said, I forgot to ask the uh, people in charge here, what's the shouting level in this building? Because when he preached, people shouted. But he said one time about the, the grave, he said, Jesus did not need a grave of his own. A borrowed grave would do just fine because he wasn't going to be there very long. I love that, that line. Our God has robbed the grave. He came out of the tomb three days later. He spent 40 days with, with his followers after that, meeting with them different times. If you read through the records, you'll notice he met with them on the first day of the week often, establishing the Lord's Day with them. And he went to the Mount of Ascension and ascended. And what they, what they saw bodily, that bodily ascension of Jesus was a powerful symbol of what he had done when he died and rose again. When he died, he led captivity captive. And you see, that's why Paul, having asserted this ascension, backs up a little bit in, in verse 9, our resurrected Savior first descended into death. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? Now that speaks of the incarnation, at least, that he came from heaven. We read Philippians 2 together. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though very God, did not cling to his equality with God as something to be jealously grasped onto, but rather made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a servant, 
coming to earth in the likeness of sinful man. Humbling himself in obedience, even the death, even unto the death of the cross. He descended in the incarnation, but folks, in his, in his life as he lived out the will of the Father, he came to a day when he descended even deeper than that. He descended into the abode of the dead for three days. Paradise, he called it. When the thief looked at him on the cross, said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I promise you, today you'll be with me in paradise. He visited for a little while, but he wasn't going to stay there long. He had to finish the final move. But mark it down, folks. People today talk about Jesus, the myth, and this, that, and the other, try to demystify. The Son of God, the eternal Son of God, took on flesh and came born of a woman who had never had an intimate relationship with a man. Born into this world, humble circumstances. The king, I love the, the contrast, the, the one who once washed our feet, now at his feet we bow. In the incarnation, in the crucifixion. You see, at the crucifixion, at the cross, I believe the devil who is not, he's not all-knowing. His, his knowledge is limited. The devil thought he had won. And one of the powerful pictures I've come across in times past was that, that the old serpent, the snake, at the cross, he, he rose up and dug his fangs into the Son of Man, but something un unexpected happened. Rather than his venom piercing through the body of Jesus to kill and poison him, Jesus drew all the venom out of the serpent and neutralized it in his death on the cross. And if all we'd had was the crucifixion, as powerful as that is, we would be a grievous people today. We would be wondering. But the grave, the grave was empty three days later. Sealed by the Romans on pain of death for the guards if they did not adequately guard the tomb because there was fear that the disciples of Jesus would come and steal his body away and claim that he'd been uh, resurrected. They way overestimated the disciples, by the way. <laughs> they were hiding. In hiding. The tomb came empty. The stone was rolled away. The Roman seal was broken, standing as infallible proof that Jesus Christ, who said he was the Son of God, who said he had come to seek and to save the lost, dying on the cross, died in our place, rising from the grave, rose that we might experience and know the power of justification. The resurrection. You see the Philippians 2 talks about this mindset. He emptied himself. Took the form of a servant. But I want you to know also our resurrected Savior is victorious over all our enemies. Verse 10 says, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Paul has gone through the movements now. He, the Son of God, descended to the lower regions of the earth, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Now alive again, he ascended. And his ascent this time is above all the heavens, preeminent that he might fill all things. You remember in Ephesians earlier in the book, chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, and, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He has brought us in on that. We serve a risen Savior, an ascended Savior, whoever lives to pray for us, 
who one day is coming again. And he defeated all of our enemies. Colossians 2 verse 15 describes it this way. He, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. You get that picture again of the conquering general, the conquering hero. He's mocked all of our enemies. In fact, so much so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 as he's closing out that chapter, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Brothers and sisters, we've lived long enough, many of us, to bury our parents. Some have buried their spouse. Some have buried a child. And we would be the most pitiable people on the planet if placing the remains of a loved one into the grave was the end of it all. But Paul knows better Christ is risen indeed, he says earlier in that chapter. The first fruits of all those who have gone to sleep, those who have died. You see, Jesus Christ, the grave robber, Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death and hell and the grave. He has taken captivity captive. So that you and I need not fear death. We need not mourn without consolation when we give up a loved one to death. If that loved one died in the Lord, we know that surely we will see them again if we are in the Lord. We grieve. But we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve with hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We grieve with the hope that he died and rose again and ascended on high and our loved ones who died in Christ are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Jesus Christ has conquered all of our enemies. So no enemy can get the best of us. Sin, death, hell, the grave. No. Those should not be battles for us. But where we do battle is the threefold enemy that faces us every day, and that's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I'm going to tell you something today. The flesh is the biggest enemy we have. And to the extent that we fight the fight of faith and subdue the things of the flesh in our lives, the world will not have sway with us, and the devil cannot mess with us. And so I wonder here today, Where's your struggle? So you've been taken captive out of the bonds of a hard taskmaster, the devil, who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. You've been taken ca captive by Jesus Christ. I've been taken captive by Jesus Christ. And our text tells us that he gives, he gives gifts to the captives. He's given the Holy Spirit to all who believe. He's given grace gifts, the charismata, an admixture of those so that we come into the body and we serve. We serve with the gifts according to His measure. But I wonder where you're struggling today. I don't live in your hip pocket, but I wonder if there are people here today who battle an addiction. Maybe it's to alcohol. Maybe illicit drugs. Maybe prescription drugs. Maybe pornography. And you struggle with it. You've claimed Christ as your Lord and Savior. And yet it seems this thing that has a grip on you seems to drag you back where you came from. I'm here to tell you today, folks, that Jesus Christ has conquered that on your behalf. And if you will run to Him again, you'll find that captivity in Christ is one of the most precious experiences in all of life. Perhaps it isn't those things. Perhaps, perhaps it's worry that you, you just find yourself worrying so much and so often. And it, it, it debilitates you. 
Perhaps it's, it's, it's a physical oppression with ailments in life. Perhaps emotional. Perhaps a dark time spiritually for you. Oh, oh, brothers and sisters, please. The resurrected king is resurrecting you. Taking you from glory to glory until the day comes when we're in a place where sin is not an option. Oh, the, the, the wonder of heaven is many fold. And one of, those, one of those facets is that for the first time in our existence, we will be in a place not only where there's no sin, sorrow, sadness, tears, but be in a place where there's not a sinful choice available to us. When the Son sets you free, you are really free. And that's where we're going if we know Jesus Christ. And yet I also cannot help but wonder if there are those sitting here today who may sing about the resurrection, who may have gotten excited about Easter Sunday, and yet Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life. You've not committed your life to Him. You've not submitted to His Lordship. You've not embraced His cross and sub submitted to His crown. He died and rose again to lead people like you out of the captivity of sin into the precious captivity of Himself. He led captivity captive. He'll lead you today. All you need to do is repent of your sin. Trust in Christ. Say, I'm coming, Lord. I'm coming to you. Acknowledging that you died and rose again. Bearing in your body my sin on that cross. Coming out of the tomb, conquering my sin and leaving my sin in that tomb so that I might become a child of the King, a son, a daughter of God. Do you know this King today? Do you know this Jesus today? Do you know Him as one who is resurrecting you? Oh, don't be satisfied with coasting. Give yourself to Him today and experience the blessed reality that the one who's been resurrected from the grave lives to bring you out of your torment, to bring you out of your pain, you out of your hurt, your heartache, your disappointment, your sin. Let's pray together. You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bless your name today as the giving God. You gave your only begotten Son so that all who would believe in Him would have the confidence that we would not perish eternally apart from Him, but we would have eternal life. We're thankful that the grave is empty we're thankful that the cross is empty. We praise you today for that, and we praise the name of Jesus today. Help us to see you today as a father whose arms are open wide to weary sinners. May the Holy Spirit invite sinners here today to come, to come to you, Experience the blessed peace and hope that forgiveness with you was bought at the cross by the blood of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb stands as an infallible proof that it is so. Help us to live like Paul said, knowing the power of the resurrection. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me if you would. As we sing to dismiss today, if you want to talk with me, I'm here available. If you want to apply for membership, plant your life in this church, I'm here to talk with you about that as well. Let's sing.
Josh introduced this last Sunday. He said that time, the altar is Jesus Christ. The beautiful thing is you can come to him right where you are. You can walk out this door 